Hello Church! We are zipping right through October and this coming Saturday, October 16th at 8 a.m. is our church cleanup day. If you're interested in volunteering, contact Samantha or Martha. It's a great opportunity to serve by volunteering your time making our building the best it can be. And remember, teaching your children and grandchildren stewardship and serving in your church to thank God for the building He has provided will help shape their future. And even if you can only come for one hour, we can use your help. Next up is October 31st at Trunk or Treat, 6 p.m. until candy is gone. We do have a sign up in the lobby if you want to volunteer, um, but if you want to also send us an email and let us know that you'll be here as a volunteer, we can take that as well. We'll need people to help pass out candy, and we're also looking for candy donations. That's also in the lobby. If you'd like to donate, just drop it off at the table. If you want to volunteer, then get a hold of me or Samantha. And next up is the YMC Prayer Breakfast. Mark those calendars, November 6th at 8.30. One of our very own New Beginnings people, Amy Debruck, is gonna be one of the guest speakers and we're excited to be able to host this again. So $20 for the tickets, you can get them from Pastor John or by visiting the YMCATriValley.org or you can stop in at the YMCA and get them from their front desk. So I hope you enjoy the service and I will see you at the end of the service. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, 
his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans 12, 2. Well, today we get in our second message in this uh, in this series called uh, "Small Groups, Big uh, Big Gains." And what we're doing in this series, we're looking at what do we gain from joining a small group. What what are the things that we gain by doing life together? And last week we talked about we gain uh, learning experiences by just sharing God's love with people who need help and. Uh, we gain as much as those other people gain uh, ourselves as far as knowledge them as far as their needs next week we're going to talk about gaining support in order to be able to overcome the challenges that we have as far as our life is concerned it's it's inevitable that we're going to have challenges and crises and things along those lines and we need other people's support for that so that's next week's uh topic but today i'd like to talk to you about gaining knowledge about going in the right direction going the right way the first time that linda and i went to israel we were in jerusalem and we had the morning off. We didn't have to go touring in this place or that place or anything like that. So we decided we were going to go to Hezekiah's tunnel. Now, Hezekiah was the king of Israel in 700 BC. So 2,700 years ago, he was king of Israel, all right? And, and what happened was this. He was, um, <clears throat> there was this threat from the Assyrian Empire that Hezekiah felt the Assyrians had come, they pretty much had ravaged Judah, the, the uh, empire, the, the nation that he had, uh, had ruled. And Hezekiah knew that they were going to be coming after him in Jerusalem. Now, he had the walls of Jerusalem to protect him, but the deal was is that there was this spring called the Gion Spring, which was outside of the walls of Jerusalem. So in order to have a supply of water, Hezekiah made sure that the Gion Spring was accessible to the people of Jerusalem inside the walls by digging a tunnel roughly a third of a mile long out of the bedrock. Well, that's what we wanted to see. And we were all fired up because, you know, this is something you read about in the Bible, but now we get a chance to actually go through it. So in the brochure that we were reading about it, it recommended that you bring a flashlight, but we didn't have a flashlight, but I figured, yeah, we'll get one in the, in the gift store or something along those lines. So we make it to the, the um, tunnel entrance, and because it was rather early, the gift store wasn't necessarily open, but I was thinking, you know what? They got to have some lights in this place. I mean, it's a tunnel a third of a mile long. There's got to be lights in it. Well, it turns out there's no lights in it, okay? Go 15 feet into the tunnel. It is as black as black can be. I had my hand right up to my face. I couldn't see my hand. It was so black in there. It was so dark. And so what I was doing was I was, I was going back and forth, back and forth, because it, could, it wasn't a big tunnel. You, you could feel the walls on either side. So I was going back and forth, and Linda had her hand on, my, on the belt on the back of my back, okay, on the backside. And we were kind of going through the tunnel, and there was water going th- you know, over our feet and everything like that. It was really pretty creepy. <sighs> and then all of a sudden... I start feeling there was a split in the tunnel. There's actually becoming two different tunnels, two different directions. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going going to happen. This is a maze down here. I thought there was only one tunnel. This is going to be a maze. I'm going to get caught down here. And I was freaking out. And long story short, I was freaking out. And I came to my senses and I basically said, I got to, I got to pull the trigger. I got to go one way or the other. So I decided I'd go and go left. Well, I go left, and at about 30 feet down, the, down that particular tunnel, we come upon an archaeological dig. It actually was uh, the Canaanite cave that the Canaanites, before the Israelites uh, in, in Jerusalem, they, they gained water through the Canaanite well. It was pretty cool watching them dig and everything along those lines, but we knew we had to go back in the tunnel because that was the only way back to the outside, and we couldn't go through the archaeological dig. Okay. So 
I get my, my courage up, go back into the tunnel, get creeped out because of the water going over my feet and everything like that while I'm trying to, trying to figure out where I'm going. And lucky for us, we see a group of people coming through the tunnel just at the point in time we got to that, that split in the tunnel. Well, we followed those people and they had a flashlight. You know, it's really, we need other people to help us find the right way. But the finding the right way isn't just a matter of somebody having a flashlight or somebody's opinion. Actually, how do we find the right way as far as our life is concerned? It's always starting out with the Bible. It's always starting out with Scripture. You know, because the way we understand it, the way we believe it, as far as the Jewish people as well as Christians, they believe that God, Yahweh, the, the God of Israel, wants to reveal himself and reveal his character and his, his, his will and his ways to his people. And he does that through inspiring his word that speaks to who he is and what he does in our lives. We can read it in, in, in wisdom literature. In Proverbs 1.7 it reads, Start with God. The first steps in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom and learning. So what, do we, what knowledge do we gain through God's inspired word? Well, first of all, we gain the knowledge of what the ideal life looks like, okay? What God desires for our life. God and his Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write about the ideal life when he wrote to the Philippian church in the second chapter that make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. So, so God shows us the ideal lifestyle to lead, but he also shows us what the actual lifestyle many of us lead. Um, God's Spirit inspired King David to write about his need for forgiveness when he had his affair with Bathsheba and when he wanted to cover up that affair by killing Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Let me read uh, King David's um, confession, if you will, found in Psalm 51. Generous in heart, God give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt, soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. See, God's Spirit um, inspired the authors, whether it be the Apostle Paul or King David, to, to write about the ideal lifestyle and the actual lifestyle we lead in order to explain to us our greatest need, and that's God's influence in our life, but also our greatest temptation in order for us to just go our own way. David, King David, wrote about this in Psalm 14. Let me read it for you, Psalm 14, 2 and 3. God sticks his head out of heaven. He looks around. He's looking for somebody not stupid, one man even. God expectant, just one God-ready woman. He comes up empty, a string of zeros, useless, unshepherded sheep, taking turns pretending to be shepherd. The 90 and 9 follow their fellow. You know, God inspired his, his writers to write the scriptures, but he also inspires those who read what has been written in scripture. You know, the, the first church that I had gone to, we had uh, pretty much regularly every summer, uh, we went to camp. And at camp, we had a great time of fellowship. We had a great time where we, we would just go through a book of the Bible and we, we'd talk about it, what, what it meant to us, each one of the verses. And it was just a, a, a 
great time of being able to bounce ideas off of one another. But there was also a really great time as far as uh, there was typically one night out of the week we would use as a... Uh, as a talent show night people would get up and sing and, and tell jokes and do all kinds of stupid stuff and we'd all laugh at one another and it had a great time one of the things that we did one year in that talent show was the the newlywed show you know you remember that tv show the newlywed game um that's what we were trying to do only with a biblical twist to it okay so there was this one couple um daniel and elaine and the question was posed to Daniel, what would you think would be the biblical character that Elaine would most closely associate you with? And Daniel's answer right off the bat turned out to be Balaam's donkey. And I laughed in that one. I had a grand old time. Balaam's donkey is actually introduced to us in Numbers 22. Balaam is this, this prophet this prophet who was able to hear from God and proclaim what God had to say to people. So consequently, Balaam had a, a great influence in the people in, in that day and age. Now, Balaam was a prophet for hire. And one of the people who wanted to hire him was Balak, the king of Moab. See, the people of Israel were coming through Moab on their way to the promised land and they were camped out in Moab and Balak wasn't particularly happy to have all these campers in his property, all right? He, he was like that old guy, get off my lawn, you know? Well, anyways, he, he tries to hire Balaam to place a curse on the people of Israel, God's people. Well, that got God's ire up, okay? So God sends his angel to keep Balaam from going to Balak. The thing is, is that Balaam couldn't see God's angel. Only Balaam's donkey could see God's angel, and especially see the sword that God's angel actually had pulled out of his sheath and ready to lop Balaam's head off, okay? So, God, uh, so, so the donkey is trying to avoid the danger of God's angel, and Balaam can't see it. He, Balaam just thinks the donkey is being rebellious. So he's beating the donkey, he's whipping the donkey, and then all of a sudden the donkey starts to talk to Balaam, but Balaam is just so anxious and angry that he doesn't even recognize that his donkey is talking to him. Kind of a weird thing, but whatever. So long story short, the donkey explains to Balaam in very reasonable terms that he's saving Balaam's life. You know, this comical story really has a very important principle to it. And that is this, even the most well-educated, even the most spiritual person needs to have the perspective of other people. <clears throat> Apollos was tremendously gifted as far as an orator in the New Testament. He was probably, in his day and age, the best speaker in the church, in Christianity. Apollos needed Priscilla and Aquila's input into his life. Let me read it for you. It's found in the 18th chapter of Acts. A man named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was a Jew born in Alexandria, Egypt, and a terrific speaker, eloquent and powerful in his preaching of the scriptures. He was well-educated in the way of the master and fiery in his enthusiasm. Apollos was accurate in everything he taught about Jesus up to a point, but he only went as far as the baptism of John. He preached with power in the meeting. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and told him the rest of the story. So uh, Apollos, we can see in this passage, Apollos came from Ephesus, uh, excuse me, uh, Alexandria. Alexandria had the school of rhetoric there. It was um, the most important school of rhetoric within the Roman Empire. So more than likely, Apollos was somehow educated or at least initiated as far as an education in this school. So he was extremely 
gifted as far as his ability to be able to preach and teach and, and speak. The second thing, Apollos, we understand from this is he was born a Jew. And by consequence, he was, he was um, steeped in the scriptures. So Apollos knew the, the scriptures of the Old Testament. He knew the law inside, backwards, upside down, and forwards, right? He was really gifted as far as that is concerned. But he didn't necessarily know anything more than the idea of repentance. That's why he taught up to John the Baptist. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He wanted people to turn around back towards God from walking away from God. And that's what Apollos was teaching. Now, Priscilla and Aquila were in this place where they had already been in close contact with Paul, the Apostle Paul. Paul had a revelation from God, and Paul expressed that revelation from God to Priscilla and Aquila, who then talk to Apollos because Apollos was talking about having an understanding of the need to repent and change, but he didn't understand how accurately. That's where Priscilla and Aquila was able to help him out with the Holy Spirit being the agent of transformation. And that was the thing that allowed Apollos to go from the uh, very uh, Jewish mindset where he pretty much was teaching about conformity to the law, being conformed from an external force to transformity through the Holy Spirit transforming and changing the heart inside out. That was Apollos' story, a very gifted speaker in his time. But perhaps the, the greatest speaker in the church history was Augustine of Hippo. But even Augustine had his journey in which he had to learn that which he could articulate eventually. See, Augustine was raised a Christian by his mother Monica, but he fell away from the faith when he was an adolescent. And he pretty much was ripping and running. He, he, he took on a mistress. He lived with her like seven years, as I recall. They had a child, a, a son together. Um, yeah, Augustine was pretty much doing his own thing, going his own way. Wasn't following anything in the way of any kind of Christian lifestyle. But he had that, that teaching that his mother had, had spoken to him and taught him in an early age, and that was gnawing at him. So consequently... Augustine refound a faith when Manny, a prophet who, uh, who spoke about this inner enlightenment in the heart and mind of every human being, being able to only access that enlightenment through severe asceticism, that's just denying self. Um, and, and so Manny's teaching really resonated with Augustine based upon the idea he knew he was living a reprobate life and he knew he needed to change. And Manny was the one who really spoke to this tension between evil and good in the heart of each and every person. And Augustine knew that that was what he was struggling with. He also knew that he had to deny himself and go forward. Those things resonated with, with Augustine, but the problem is, is that he never found out until Ambrose why he should respond to God and his love. See, it was, it was St. Ambrose, the Bishop of, of Milan, that really taught Augustine what it was to be able to receive the love of God in his life and to respond to that. See, Augustine wanted to, he wanted to live a, a purposeful and virtuous life, but it was only Ambrose who allowed him to understand why he should live that that type of lifestyle and that's just out of responsiveness to god's love and these 
these principles that um, Ambrose instilled in Augustine actually consolidated and became values. And as Augustine became uh, more and more um, involved with the church and church um, understanding as far as God's will and ways in the world and in hearts, Augustine actually used his, his considerable rhetorical skills to argue with a guy by the name of Pelagius. Pelagius was this priest from England who, who basically said, um, God has given us everything we need with the law. It's going back to Apollos and understanding that we can gain our salvation by our own means. We don't need divine grace. And that's according to Augustine and according to just about everybody else as far as Christianity is concerned, is absolutely key. You know, we need one another. Even the most gifted person needs other people. Today, there are tons of people who have opinions. And I'm not saying that we need to listen to everybody's opinion. But for those people who have a perspective from Scripture, because you got to start with Scripture. And for those people who have a perspective from Scripture, that offers us a better understanding of understanding of, of what God has for us as far as a clear understanding. You know, this, this, I, this is an iPhone 12. I guess there's an iPhone 13 these days, but I got an iPhone 12. And that's good enough for me. But this iPhone 12, when I got it, I was amazed that it has three lenses, three actual cameras built into it. And what they do, I, uh, Apple... Uh, advertises it as being superior to the earlier iPhones because of the multiple lenses gives a clearer understanding or a clearer picture that you can take. The same thing pertains to perspectives of, of, of Scripture. We start with God. Wisdom always starts with God, but we need one another to allow us to be able to have a better understanding of perspective of what God is trying to convey. Because God guides through a group. Or as our takeaway says, knowledge comes from God's word meandering through the interpretation of God's people. As far as next steps are concerned, I offer to you four of them like I usually do. You can return next Sunday, uh, or next week I should say, and we're gonna be talking about uh, gaining uh, support from other people in order to overcome the challenges as far as life is concerned. You could uh, find out about uh, um, life groups. Um, just commit to find out about what life groups are open as far as uh, NBCC. You can, uh, you can go to our website, nbcc.today, and find out about them. You can sign up for a life group uh, at nbcc.today. So um, you, can, you can get involved with a life group even today. Or you could uh, commit to start or host or, or, or just lead a life group. I don't know what the next step with you might be as far as this, this is concerned, but I know you got a next step. And I know that you can find a lot of help in understanding the Bible better when you have other people's perspectives and you can bounce that off. And that's what life groups give. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we give you thanks. We thank you so much because wisdom always begins with you, begins with your word. But so many times we get into the place where we miss the memo. We miss the message based upon the idea we just have one perspective. And although it might be a good perspective, it's always better when we have another perspective. Help us to be able to understand this premise. Help us to be able to embrace this and help us to go forward in this for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning. I want to encourage you this morning in the area of tithes and offerings. You know, every week we usually tell you how important it is to give uh, of our tithes. And, you know, the Bible talks about uh, giving 10% of our first fruits, of our, of our 
what we make as far as income. And that's very important because churches like households uh, have, uh, have bills to pay. That's important. But there's something else I want to encourage you in the area of giving. I want to share with you just something my wife read last week for Scripture. And listen to what it says in the message. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. You know, that's a different kind of offering we can give. The, the fact that, that God blesses each of us with gifts to magnify and help His kingdom, those are the same gifts we need as a church for you to give to us. You may have an ability to work with children or mow the lawn or do electrical stuff. Those are all gifts God gives you and that you're good at. And those are awesome offerings you can give to the church just as well as your tithe. So I want you to think about that as you think about different ways to help us out at the church and do something that God would be a great blessing to us. Thank you. Have a great day.
keep my eyes above the waves. So rest in your embrace, 'cause I am yours. And I'm back. Don't forget to join us next week as Pastor John continues in the series, Small Groups and Big Gains. And like I always say, don't forget to like and share the service on Facebook and YouTube. Have a good week. YMCA of the Greater Tri-Valley presents 7th Annual Prayer Breakfast. Inspiration comes to This year's featured guest speakers include... Arthur Aiken, Amy Debrook, and national recording artist Brooke Robertson. Hey, it's Brooke Robertson. I cannot wait to see you guys at the YMCA of the Greater Tri-Valley's annual prayer breakfast held on November 6th, 8.30 to 11 at New Beginnings Community Church. I'm coming up from Louisiana and I am so excited. I hope you guys are too. See you very soon. Join us November 6th for the 7th Annual YMCA Prayer Breakfast at New Beginnings Community Church in Wamsville. Tickets are $20 each with all proceeds benefiting the Wise Changing Lives Scholarship Fund. See you there!